guys for being here, um, for spending the next hour with me. It's kind of a big deal for me because I never went to college, and I feel like we're, we're, we're university level here. Yeah. And it, it's so interesting to me how the last becomes first and the first becomes last. I never thought I would be here. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a little about, about um, pilgrimage. And last time I gave a speakeasy, I talked about uh, my journeys through India and shared some really um, interesting stories about that adventure. And I thought that's what I was going to talk about here. And then just recently we were in Seattle. Hey, some folks from Seattle? And while we were in Seattle, uh, a young lady came up to me. We did an intimate concert. And she said she really appreciated the parts in between the songs where I shared a little bit of my story about how I became MC Yogi. And some of you may have heard a little bit about how I became MC Yogi, some not. Um, but today what I'd like to do is talk about my own personal pilgrimage, becoming a yogi, and sharing some stories that up until now I have never really shared publicly. Um, because my path to become a yogi was, it was not easy. It was fraught with a lot of difficulty, a lot of pain, and a lot of suffering. Um, and I think that it's important to share these stories, not to glorify or glamorize myself, but for the intention of if it helps anyone else who's still in that difficult place, um, just to know that there is a way to carve through the darkness and get to the other side of it if you stick with your practices. Um, so we'll keep the title Pilgrimage because it is a journey uh, from darkness to light, moving from confusion and illusion to the realization that love is the solution. So, so this is my story, and I think the best place to begin is at the beginning. So I was born 1979. It was the same year that the rap group Sh Sugar Hill Gang came out with their breakout single, Rapper's Delight. So I was born the year when hip hop like officially became a recognized genre. And I was born in San Francisco. Uh, my mother was actually in labor with me. She almost gave birth to me on the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and I grew up in California in the Bay Area. And I grew up in an amazing family. Just to give you a little background, my mother uh, immigrated to America seven brothers and sisters um, from a small island off the coast of Portugal came to this country, didn't speak any English, came to America and had little, very little money. So my family kind of represents, you know, this American idea that you can come to this new world and build a life and make a better life for your family and for your kids, which they did. Um, also on my father's side, my father's side is Italian and they immigrated to America during the gold rush. Um, and I have very fond memories growing up with my grandfather who was a product of the depression. His name was Toby. And he used to always say, Toby or not Toby? <laughs> that is the question. Um, so I grew up with an amazing family. I'm, I'm the oldest of three. I have a younger brother and a younger sister. My little brother's uh, an amazing, uh, well-known DJ who plays on one of the biggest hip-hop radio stations in San Francisco. Uh, my sister is a very dear, uh, beautiful person, great friend. And um, so I grew up like that, the beautiful family. And everything was kind of cool until about six, seven years old. And the whole structure of my family was solid. But at that time, I started to see some cracks in the facade and things were getting a little rocky. And it got to the point where the floor fell out from under us and there was a huge sort of tragedy in our family and everything got kind of broken and fragmented. Um, it led to my parents getting divorced, which is really kind of the tip of the iceberg. Um, but up until that time, I felt really uh, secure, really happy. And then when my parents got divorced and all the drama that was swirling around our family, it kind of threw me into this state where I didn't know what was real. I didn't know what I could rely on. I didn't know what was true. Because everything that I thought was real and true 
became broken. And as a little kid, I really wanted to fix it. I really wanted to mend the wound and, and bring the people back together on the different sides. But I started to realize that I didn't have that power, that I was powerless in this situation, that things had to break, things had to crumble, things had to dissolve. It's a part of it. So while all this was happening, I was probably about six or seven years old and I got my first taste, my first conscious memory of hip hop. And the song that I first heard was from a female rap group called JJ Fad. And the song was called Supersonic. And I remember the first time I heard those lyrics, it was like lightning was striking my brain. The S is for super, the U is for unique, the P is for perfection, because you know that we are freaks. <laughs> the E is for exotic and the R is for rap. So tell those nosy people just to stay the hell back. Supersonic. And when I heard that, I was like, oh my gosh, what is that? It was the coolest thing I'd ever heard. And just instantly I fell deeply and madly in love with hip hop. Now around that time, um, I had a neighbor, young Jewish kid, who was a little older than me. And he could rap. He could actually rap. He wasn't that good, but he could actually bring the words together and he made his own rap. So like I was looking up to this kid living next door and like I wanted to be I wanted to aspire to be like that the idea that I could make poetry make my own songs now growing up I was always um, an artist I loved to paint I loved to draw I loved to read comic books and early on my mom gave me an amazing book about Greek mythology so I was always very interested in these ancient stories from the ancient world and just a little side note if you're going to give a kid a gift, one of the best presents you can give them is a really good book or really good music. Because when you're young, those books that I remember reading and those, the music that I was listening to, it shaped my world. It helped me to like really uh, broaden my mind and develop my imagination, which in yoga we know imagination is key. Because if we can believe in something, we can achieve it. We have to believe it if we want to achieve it. So being able to see it in your mind first is really a huge step toward moving toward that horizon of where you want to go. Now when my parents split up, um, things got really kind of shaky. Um, I was listening to a lot of hip hop. Eight years old, I, it was my birthday and I had saved up enough money and I went to, at that time we had the warehouse, which was a record store. We don't have so many record stores anymore. But I remember, I was like a kid in a candy store. I had enough money to buy two cassettes. And I was so happy because I got the two greatest, in my opinion, hip hop albums of all time. And it, the first one was the BC Boys, Licensed to Ill. And the second one was Run DMC, Raising Hell. <laughs> and that's all I wanted to do was just raise hell. Um, and it was my license to ill. So, so I had my Sony Walkman. I had that on full blast my whole childhood, eight, nine, ten years old. Uh, and then my family started to move around. And I found that like during the, those difficult times, hip hop became my escape. It became my doorway to another, another dimension, another world. A world where people were creative, where people were having fun, you know, people were dancing, expressing themselves. And for me, it was like a, a gateway to freedom because my home life and the things that were going on were just too difficult to deal with. Um, so music became my medicine, became my remedy. That being said, I was also starting to dip my mind into a lot of music that was a little more poisonous because the messaging and the lyrics were really kind of detrimental to a young person's sort of concept of reality. Um, Hip hop started to take a turn uh, it started as a people's movement. It started as a community, sort of people coming together as an alternative to gang culture. It started in New York, in the Bronx actually, and people coming together because a lot of people couldn't afford to go to the disco. So they would put free shows on in the park with huge sound systems. Um, cool Herc, someone you should know about, is considered the godfather of hip hop, Africa Bambada. So I, I was always, um, growing up, I loved hip hop. Me and my brother. He's a DJ, I was an MC, I was a graffiti artist. 
Um, so I was listening to it all the time. And I started to sort of play with my own rhymes here and there, and they were just horrible. They were terrible. They were garbage. Like, I was very, very not good at all. So I never really did it in public because it was very embarrassing. Um, but I kept practicing and making up my own little rhymes. Now, around that time, and if things get a little confusing um, and a little dark and windy as I tell this story, it's only because that's how I felt when all this was happening. And I'm going to try to stay as chronological as possible um, as we sort of move into the period of when I was about 12 years old. Now, around that time, um, my parents thought that I was depressed, so they put me into therapy. And I could not stand therapy. I thought it was like torture. I really did not like it at all. And um, the doctors suggested that I start taking Ritalin. You know, they thought I had ADD. I was acting up. Um, one of my sort of escapes besides hip hop music and drawing was I basically became like a narcoleptic, like I just slept. Like that was my escape because when I slept, I could control my dreams and I felt a sense of control. In my dreams, I could move in different directions and create different scenarios and I felt a sense of freedom. I was able to escape. But that didn't bode very well in school because I was often on my desk with a big puddle of drool <laughs> sleeping while the teacher was trying to teach. So I ended up getting kicked out of school. I failed all my classes. Um, eighth grade graduation, the police were waiting outside because I had ran away from home and I'd showed up at the graduation to walk down the aisle to receive my certificate, which was blank because I had failed. Um, so it was just drama. And then, you know, I went to summer school. That didn't work out too well. Ended up going to public high school. And around this time in public school, um, I was hanging out with some kids. I got mixed up in drugs. I started doing drugs when I was about 11 or 12. Started smoking, drinking, getting high, uh, running away from home. And when I started high school, I was hanging out with some kids and mind you, I didn't grow up in like a, a bad neighborhood, but there was gangs and I got mixed up with some gangs. Um, at one point I was walking with my friend and we were at the gas station on the corner and two carloads of guys pulled up, big guys, cause I was like a freshman. They opened up their door and they ran toward us. And in retrospect, when I was thinking about it, the first thing I heard before they beat the living daylights out of us was, brace yourself. So it was like nature was even preparing me in that moment. There was even like a drop of kindness in that experience when I was getting pummeled. I was on the floor, my head was against the curb, and they were kicking my head against the concrete. They cracked my nose open. I ended up crawling home. Um, and it was like that growing up. You know, some, my cousin got stabbed at one point when he was trying to protect me in a fight. Um, some kid got stabbed on my front porch, almost died. I knew the kids who stabbed him. Um, it got to the point where I had, I purchased a stolen gun. Uh, it was a 357 revolver and I was carrying it in my backpack and it was just like in my backpack, like a brick, just this big, huge gun walking around. I was like 13 years old. Um, and the whole time listening to hip hop. And hip hop, again, was like a double-edged sword because on one hand, I was getting a lot of this sort of mixed messages that were kind of chauvinistic, that was violent, that was very egocentric. But then at the same time, there was these certain artists and one in particular who I talked about yesterday in class was MCA from the Beastie Boys. And MCA had this song called Bodhisattva Vow. And it was this song that was his sort of declaration, his prayer dedicating his life to be, uh, to benefit all beings. And there was one particular line in that song that stuck out in my mind. And it said, when others disrespect me or give me flack, I'll stop and think before I react. I'll nip it in the bud before it can worsen, seeing it as a chance to help the other person. I'll recognize that they're going through insecure stages and take it as an opportunity to exercise patience. Now that little line for me was like 
because I was just reacting to everything that was happening to me. I was reacting to what was going on in my family. I was reacting to what my friends were doing. I was being bullied by my friends. I was getting mixed up in horrible situations. At that time, I was, me and my friend, 14 years old, we used to steal cars and drive to the city where we painted graffiti. <laughs> and I remember one night we were driving home like three in the morning and I look over and I saw, he never saw us, but right next to us was our, our fa a family friend. And if he would have looked over, he would have seen my little 14-year-old head in that stolen car, and he would have known. But we kept going. And um, it got to the point where my friend, who we'd steal the car with, he ended up rolling the car one night. Fortunately, I wasn't there, and he got away okay. But it was like that. We were just doing very foolish things. There was no direction. It was just, let's see if we could go paint more graffiti. Let's see if we could get a little higher. Um, you know, friends were selling drugs, oftentimes out of my bedroom. I would be there helping to chop up the cocaine or the speed. We'd package it and then, you know, he would go out and sell it. They were selling acid, selling weed, uh, mushrooms, like everything. Um, and it's not like I grew up in a bad family. I grew up in a good family. Um, but if you're looking for trouble, it's, it's right there around the corner. It's always here. And so I got mixed up in it. So around that time, I was out painting graffiti. We used to go paint on the freeways, we, under the overpass, on freight trains. Um, and one time in particular, we had driven to San Francisco because I, I was living in the North Bay. And we drove down to the city with my friend. He had a big uh, milk crate full of spray cans. And we went into the tunnel where the trains go through. It was actually the J Tunnel. And we, were, we started getting up. We started painting our murals. I, he was really good with letters. And I used to paint characters because I used to love cartoons. And so we were in there painting. You know, when the train would come by, it'd rush by, and you'd have to kind of stand against the wall so you didn't get, <laughs> didn't get hit. And so we did that, you know, you know a couple hours later. We picked up our empty cans and our milk crate and we started walking out of the tunnel. And as we're walking out of the tunnel, this huge light flashes on us. And it's the graffiti task force. And they caught us. And this guy, this particular officer, was so nasty. He hated graffiti artists so bad. And it was like, it was like a fisherman who just caught two big fish. He was like just out to get us. It was like a sting operation. So he confiscated all our stuff, handcuffed us, put us on the curb. As we were sitting there, he starts reading us our rights. We see our car getting towed. And in that moment when he's about to book us and take us to jail, he gets this call. <laughs> you know, we got a da 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 at da 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 location. And apparently someone had got shot in the head. And he had to leave immediately. And he didn't want to. He wanted to book us so bad. Um, and he was really just mean. And so he took all our stuff, left us there. We had no keys, no money, nothing. We we're just in the city. So we ended up sleeping on the street. Um, and I just remember I had ran away a few times with that one night in particular because I didn't have a jacket and just being out in the cold on the concrete with no shelter no money for food. And that always, I'm always reminded of that uh, when I walk through the city because I, you know, there's a lot of homeless people in San Francisco. And just having spent that one night, like I always feel um, just compassion for the homeless people because that was just one night. I can't possibly imagine like sleeping on the street every night, looking for food, trying to stay warm every night, trying to survive. So these are like the, the scars, the past impressions. This is all before yoga. Now, I was, because I was doing so poorly in school, I was getting kicked out of every school they put me in. Got kicked out of continuation school. And then my parents and I actually, we decided that I was going to go leave and live in a group home for three years. So I went to um, this group home, and it was one of the best things that I ever could have did with my life because it helped me to create some space for my situation and it gave me structure and discipline, which as a young, as a young man, like you need some discipline in your life and um, just that regularity. And I didn't, you know, I didn't know anything about yoga. You know, I wish, I wish that I would have found yoga when I was like 13 or 14, 
because I feel like I could have bypassed all this pain and all this, um, these intense experiences. Um, so I hope this is not too depressing. It does get better. Is it? <laughs> we did make it here. So I ended up at the group home, but it gets a little worse before it gets better. <laughs> Everyone in the group home got kicked out. It was a drug conspiracy. We were funneling drugs in. We were all going up to the roof of the group home and we were all getting as completely high as we possibly could. If you were to drive by this building and you would see a puff of smoke, you would think that someone had a fire and it was coming from the chimney. No, it was like 20 juvenile delinquents on the roof <laughs> getting really, really high. Um, and we all got busted and we all got kicked out. Now, for whatever reason, the desire in me was so strong. I knew that if I didn't get back into that program, that I wasn't gonna make it on some level. I was gonna end up in juvenile hall or prison. I was looking around. Some of my friends um, committed suicide. Some took drugs, overdosed, and were never the same. They fried their brain. They're just, their personality was gone. Uh, some got pregnant really early. Some uh, ended up going to war join the military and some just you know they just weren't doing anything they're just sort of chasing their tail spinning in circles and I was looking around and I was seeing this and I said I gotta get back in this program it's the only way I'm gonna make it it's the only way I'm gonna survive so I kept going back over and over and over again and I wrote a letter and I delivered it to the director whose name was John Cruz who if it weren't for that man I probably wouldn't be here today it was because of his kindness and compassion because he saw that my desire was strong enough that I needed to come back, that he gave me a second chance. And maybe there's someone in your life who's given you a second chance when it seemed like everything, like everyone else had given up on you. So he was like that. He believed in me. He let me come back. I ended up graduating the program a year late. Um, and when I graduated, High school was like the thick of it. It was the worst time in my life. It was like the dark night of my soul for like four years. <laughs> it was horrible. And, but when I graduated, I was so happy. It was like the light at the end of the tunnel. I was no longer bound by this institution or this system. I could be an artist. I could find my way. I could go out, pursue what I love, and, and do what I came here to do. So with that in mind, I ended up moving back with my dad. Now, my dad unbeknownst to me, had been practicing yoga for the past, I don't know, four or five years. And I had seen this gradual transformation. He went from being very overweight, depressed, sick, stressed. Over the years, I saw him become more healthy, more happy, more generous, more kind. And I started to question it. I said, what, what are you doing? Like, what you found something that works. Like, what, what is it that you're doing? And never once did he ever say to me, you should practice yoga. Because the moment he would have said that, I would have turned around and ran as far in the other direction as humanly possible. But he never told me to practice yoga. But it was like a flower that opens, that releases and emits a fragrance. You're naturally drawn to it. You don't even have to talk about it. You just, you can taste it. You can feel it. Something has happened. Something has changed. So my dad had started practicing with this man in San Francisco whose name was Larry Schultz. And that's a name you should remember because Larry was one of the greatest teachers in my life. He introduced me to my wife, Amanda. He helped my dad. He saved my family, basically, because through yoga, we were able to heal, reconcile. There was redemption. We were able to come together again and move forward. And it's still happening. So my dad started practicing with Larry. And Larry, I'll just give you a little background about Larry. That's a good boat pose. He used to always teach boat pose before Chaturanga. That's good. Larry was known as the bad man of Ashtanga Yoga. Larry was a student of Sri K. Patavi Joyce, who, um, if any of you are familiar with the lineage of Mysore Yoga, um, the lineage of Krishnamacharya, it's actually, it's the, the pipeline through which we get vinyasa yoga. Most of the yoga that's practiced here at the festival or in America or anywhere now is a derivative of this form of vinyasa krama yoga. Um, and 
But Patabi Joyce was really the pioneer who brought it to the Western shores um, via a lot of cool hippies and surfers. So, so Larry was a student of Patabi, um, and Larry discovered yoga in Jamaica. He tells a great story. He was sitting in this cabana one day, just getting like shit face drunk. And he sees this guy over on this rock. And he's moving in this fluid, beautiful way. And Larry gets so drunk that he passes out. And he thinks it's like a dream or a vision. So he sobers up, comes back the next day, and he looks out and the same man is practicing Ashtanga Yoga on this rock. So as Larry tells it, he goes over to the rock and he says, excuse me, sir, what are you doing? I've never seen anything like this before. It's so beautiful. And the man says, it's Ashtanga Yoga. And I, I learned it from my teacher, Patabi Joyce. So Larry gets lit up. He gets, he sees it, you know, and in the yoga tradition, the word darshan means to see, to have the vision. And actually, the definition of the word knowledge is to, to see it, to recognize it, to understand it. When you see someone, you can recognize them. You can get to know them. So Larry had the vision. He saw yoga. He went home and he found... Uh, he ended up studying with Patabi Joyce, who had come to America. And then he went back to India and studied with him there as well. And Larry tells this great story where Patabi Joyce, who didn't speak a lot of English, used to say, you remember how it goes, sweetie? He says, some people, some practitioners, good student, good student all, is coming, all is coming seven years. Medium, student, Medium students, all is coming, all is coming 12, 12 years. years. This man, that man, so bad man, bad man, all is coming 25, 25 years. <laughs> So now some people would hear that and be like, oh man, Larry was like, you mean in 25 years, I can get there, I can know what you're talking about? He was so pumped up. So he dedicated his life in the next 25 years to developing and understanding the system of Ashtanga Yoga. And within that period, he started teaching. He opened a studio in San Francisco. It was one of the first main vinyasa studios in San Francisco. And not a lot of people know this, that, but it's because of Larry Schultz that yoga is so popular today because Larry made it fun. And what he did was he deviated from the system. He modified it for modern people, which is why people hated him because people wanted it to stay traditional. And people thought he was crazy. But because he was able to adapt it, and here's the reason why he adapted it, because he was traveling with the Grateful Dead. Yes. <laughs> he was teaching yoga to the Grateful Dead, and Larry would go up to Bob Weir or Phil Lesh and say, okay, what time are we practicing yoga? And they're like, what time are we practicing yoga? They're like, no, dude, there's not gonna be a regular schedule here. <laughs> so Bob Weir, who I had the good fortune of meeting this year, who's an amazing guy, he said to Larry, look, you're gonna have to modify this. So Larry started to develop a shorter routine that the Grateful Dead could practice and people on the road could practice. And when he developed the system, he, he asked Bob, well, what should we call it? And Bob said, we'll call it the rocket. And Larry said, why are we gonna call it the rocket? And he says, because it gets you there quicker. So that's how the rocket, rocket yoga was born. And that's how me and Amanda met, was studying with Larry in San Francisco. And so my dad started practicing with Larry. And when I got home, after graduating that group home, I started to sort of pry and prod my dad. I said, what is it, what, what have you found that I need to know about? I really wanna know. I was ready. And he said, it's Ashtanga yoga. You probably won't like it. He said, I said, why not? He says, it's kind of hard. And he's like, <laughs> but you can come to the class if you want. So I came to the class and it was a small group of students. They were practicing what's called Mysore style yoga, which means there's not a teacher. Everyone knew the system. They were breathing. There's probably about five people, two carpenters, um, the lady who ran the local bakery, um, and also a, a, another young lady who, who ended up starting her own bakery. So it was working class people who were coming in after work. I mean, these guys were like, these guys were like superheroes to me 
because they were working construction and building stuff all day long. And then they would come late at night and do Ashtanga yoga together in a circle. And for me, it was like superhero training because I always had this vision that yoga was like this soft, sort of like lame thing that I really didn't, wouldn't ever be interested in. But when I saw him practicing Ashtanga yoga, I was like, this is the coolest, most amazing thing I've ever seen. And the moment I put my feet on the mat, I had this huge, just this, this flood, this like feeling that I had come home. I found my path. I found my way. Through all the trials and tribulations, I'd found my practice. And this practice was going to deliver me because I was going to take it all the way I could. So in that moment, I realized that yoga was it for me. And everyone's got to find their thing. It's not going to be the same for everyone. For me, it was yoga, uh, yoga and hip hop. And so when I started practicing, I just... It was hard, it was so difficult. Like I was shaking downward dog and it was like, it was awkward and because I hadn't been very physical up to that point. I would like, I would dance, I could break dance a little bit, um, but I was not athletic. But the thing that I really loved about yoga and why I gravitated toward it is because it was non-competitive. And I never liked competition. I really never liked competition for some reason. Even when I was growing up and we'd sneak out the house late at night and we'd go to house parties, the part of my sort of adolescence that I love before yoga, more than anything where I felt that same freedom that I felt on the yoga mat, was this one particular moment where we go to a party and people would gather in ciphers. There'd be circles. And within the circle, you know, people were drinking, smoking, getting high. You know, there was fights and all kinds of terrible stuff, but in those ciphers, people would freestyle and we would battle each other. And it was all about seeing who is the best MC, who had the most skills. Now, unfortunately, most of the MCs who I would battle with and rhyme with, they were all about tearing each other down, like talking about your mother and saying how goofy you look and all these kinds of things. So you had to kind of wade through that. I was never that kind of MC. The kind of MC I was was I just wanted to be creative. I wanted to be artistic. In those moments when I was freestyling, I felt freedom. Like everything sort of, the walls crumbled and I just allowed this current of creativity to course through me and I felt free. I felt happy. So that kind of stuck with me. When I started practicing yoga, at first... If hip hop was all the stuff on the table, I went like this. I don't want anything to do with hip hop. I'm done. I'm just about yoga. I just want yoga morning, <laughs> noon, and night. I would just like, I was swallowing as many books as I could about yoga. My mom gave me this incredible book by Herman Hesse called Siddhartha, which was really powerful for me. I, I probably read that when I was like 18. Um, I got a hold of Autobiography of a Yogi, which is really uh, pivotal. Um, the Alchemist, The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. There was a few amazing books, Peaceful Warrior by Dan Millman, a few incredible books along the journey that were like friends to me, and they sort of helped me sort of move through the transition. Because when I started doing yoga, nobody I knew was doing yoga. It was like this underground thing that it was not popular like it is now. I'm so grateful that it's more popular. Um, because it's, it's starting to affect our cultural landscape in a healthy way. People are becoming more kind, more aware, more strong, more resilient. But at that time, I was still like 19, 18, 19. No one I knew was doing yoga. In fact, if you were doing yoga, you, you were like weird. So I couldn't really relate to anyone my age. So I turned to these books, and I spent a lot of time with books. Um, I taught myself you know, different yoga postures, meditation, read from the scriptures. And I sort of brushed every, all my hip hop off the table because I felt like it was a distraction. But gradually, as I started to deepen my practice, you know, at first I had to pull away to find myself. But then I realized that I couldn't deny all those parts of myself that I still loved. There were still those moments when like I was, as an MC, I was so happy. You know, when I was performing and seeing everyone smile and put their hands up and jumping and like, those are the best times for me growing up. We used to create this event at this place called The Shop um, after I'd left the group home. And 
it was a hip hop forum. It was like a poetry slam. We'd have a band, MCs, DJs, B-boys, graffiti artists, and everyone would come together. Because in the beginning, hip hop was a culture of four elements. It was the DJ, the music. You guys know this? It's a pop quiz, no? There was the MC, there was the B-boy, the B-girl, the dancer, and then there was the graffiti art. And then the fifth element, which is, is sort of unspoken, is knowledge itself. It's spirit, space, it's what holds it all together, it's the glue. Essentially, it's love. It's what holds all communities together, it's what holds the culture together. So when I started, um, got involved in hip-hop, that was the hip-hop that I grew up with. And then, you know, hip-hop kind of changed over the years. It became a little more materialistic, a little more negative. But in the beginning, it was fun. Um, and there's still great MCs out there who are keeping it alive. So, gradually, the hip-hop part of me started to resurface. I couldn't deny it. I, I was always an MC. In the beginning was the word, and the word was on. When the word was heard, it began to echo from the base of the spine to the tip of the tongue. Feel the light shining brighter than a million suns. Ancient scriptures, graffiti painted pictures, monks meditate to create the perfect mixture of heaven and earth. Root down in the ground. If mind is sky, sun shines through the clouds. So it started to come together. Everything I was learning in yoga started to blend with, hip, with all the hip hop that I grew up with. And at first, um, I started, I, did, I suppressed it. I didn't want to start rapping again because I was so busy unwrapping. I didn't want to start rapping again. But gradually, but inevitably, they came together. And the moment when they came together, sort of, the, which kind of the clincher that sealed the deal, was at my, my wedding day with my wife, Amanda. All our friends and family were gathered. It was a gorgeous day. It was a Sunday in August. We've been married. This will be our 10-year anniversary this year. We're about to go on our second honeymoon. Yeah. And it was, the DJ was playing a record. And we were, we got married in our yoga studio. We've had, a, we've been running a yoga studio for about 12 years now um, in, in Northern California. And the DJ was, you know, playing music and people were dancing. Some of my friends were break dancing there. And then he played this Beastie Boy song. It goes, brass monkey, that funky monkey. And then my friend, Ross, who you may see his bicycles around, he's the founder and the inventor of the extra cycle. He invented this bike, which it's like a stretch limousine for your bike. He calls it the SUB instead of SUV. It's the sports utility bike. Um, he says it's the bike that hauls your TV to the dump. Is it? <laughs> He's all about at the outdoors. So. so he was there, and we were in our studio, and there's this statue of Hanuman that was actually given to us by um, a great Ashtanga yoga teacher named Tim Miller from Encinitas, California. Who Tim was a great student of Patabi Joyce. He's still teaching in Encinitas. If you ever get the chance to study with him, he's an amazing yogi. He's like a superhero. And this little statue of Hanuman, it's a Morty like this. My friend Ross, as this song is playing, Brass Monkey, he picks up the Brass Monkey and he's like, he starts pointing at it. And I was like, whoa. I was like, I, was like, I had like a light bulb moment. I was like, you mean I could rap about yoga philosophy? I say, like, that sounds amazing. And so literally on my wedding day, these two things that I love the most were married. They were joined. It was the, that was the clincher. I said, yes, I do. Became MC Yogi. But actually the way I became MC Yogi was we were on a trip to India and we were studying in Mysore with Patabi Joyce. And there was a rooftop of this restaurant. And we decided, Amanda and I, that we wanted to, we were so lit up and having such a good time and meeting so many incredible people and being so inspired by, you know, India and all the temples and just the culture that we wanted to give a free concert to give back. So we printed up these flyers and we wheat pasted around uh, Mysore, put these flyers up at all the chai stalls and in the rickshaws and, and we started spreading the word. Um, and we threw this free concert on the roof. And there was no sound system, there was no microphone. It was me, this German guy who just graduated uh, college studying percussion. He had a tali plate, which is a silver plate, a salt shaker, and 
a bucket. Yeah, a water bucket. And then the owner of the restaurant, was his name Ganesh? Had his tablas. So it was me and this ragtag band, and we performed and we rocked it, dude. People were like, they loved it. They were like, what the heck is this? And that's, that was the first time I ever performed as MC Yogi, was in India. Um, and so the two worlds came together. Now, I had mentioned we're going on our second honeymoon in just a couple, couple weeks. On our first honeymoon, there was all these omens along the way. I would mentioned MCA a little earlier, the Bodhisattva vow, and how that song really moved me and helped sort of after, you know, that song basically helped me. To, I got rid of the gun. You know, I um, started to become a little interested in Buddhism and meditation. Not fully, but it was like a seed was planted. But while we were on our honeymoon, we went, we were practicing Ashtanga Yoga um, on the island. And we were in the studio, and we were practicing. There was two other people. It was a very small studio. And one, one of the yogis we were practicing with, he owned the local bakery. It's interesting, this reoccurring theme of bakeries, man. I think, I think yoga is like that, right? It's like you get cooked a little bit until you're ready. And so we're there with him and this other guy, and I swear he looks so familiar to me, and he was so cool. And, um, and then, you know, we're just practicing, and, you know, I think we were working on second series at that point. He helped me out in my pose, and I helped him out, and then afterwards we're just talking. And it was Mike D from the PC Boys. <laughs> and I was like, man. And I swear, like... I, was, I just was starting to write my, my, my yoga-inspired rhymes at that point. And for me, when I met Mike Diamond, um, I don't even know if, if, if Mike remembers, but like, for me, it was, like, it was a life-changing experience. It was like an omen. Because I met someone that I grew up listening to. He was super kind, super humble, super down-to-earth. And he was, just, he, was, he was a great yogi. So for me, I was like, man, this, it's possible. Like you can become, you can do what you love, you can follow your dreams, um, and you can do it all. You could have the best of both worlds. You can live in this world. You could be of service. You can do work for your community, for your family, and for your friends, and you can do what you love at the same time. And to me, that was a huge awakening for me, that I could do everything that I love most, and I could dedicate it to everyone. Is for me, it's like my mind just flipped, and it all made sense. It all became clear. So all that hardship that I'd went through, like all the difficulty, all the pain, all the suffering, it wasn't for nothing. It made me strong, and it pushed me in the direction. It bended me back into myself. It made me learn how to source strength, energy, and inspiration from here so I could serve out there. Um, but it was rocky. And sometimes I look back, and even last night I had a dream. Because, I mean, this talk is not scripted. I didn't really, like, write this out. This is just, this is written on the lines in the soles of my feet. This is where I've been. This is my story. Uh, but I'm not bound by my story. I'm not captive by my story. My story informs me. I learn from it. I, I, I extract wisdom from it, but I'm not held down by it. It's just the beginning of the story. That's the best part. It's, it's, hap it's being written right now. And... For me, yeah, I just I remember my dreams last night, and I started to see all these faces and all these people from my past, and it was like they were visiting me, reminding me, like everything happened so that you could be here, like you survived, you're alive. I was in three major car accidents where I should have died. I was in situations where I could have easily been killed. One particular car accident I later found out, um, I was in the car with my dad, and he was driving up this hill. It's actually like this little mountain. And it was at a time, it was before, I think it was either before, right around the divorce, maybe like right after, so he was just really stressed out. He was struggling and suffering a lot. Um, I remember specifically we were listening to Bob Marley in the car. And that was like offering like a little piece. And I, I saw that he was just really stressed out. And I was in the seat right behind him. So I started to massage his shoulders. Because I love my dad. I want him to be happy and healthy and relaxed. 
But in that moment, the car, the wheel got caught on the shoulder off of the pavement. And he tried to correct it, but it was too much. And we flipped the car and we rolled down this ravine, like this gorge. My sister's hand went through the window. Um, me and my brother were in the back seat and we landed on the side and I was the oldest of the three kids so I climbed out of the car first and I looked out and if we would have kept going we would have gone over the edge so I ran up to the road and as I ran up I remember I heard this voice and it said stop and I looked down and there was a live wire from the telephone that we knocked over that I was about to step on and then I stepped back and he said, don't move. Help is on the way. Don't move. Help is on the way. My dad carried my sister up, my brother, and eventually the ambulance came. They pulled the glass out of my sister's arm. Everyone was okay. My sister still has the scars on her, on her hand and her arm, but everyone was okay. No one was killed. We were all still alive. It was traumatic, but later I realized that that was the car accident that sent my dad to yoga. It was through that moment of feeling totally out of control and like life was burning and crashing that sent him to yoga. That's when he went and started studying with Larry. And it was because of that traumatic experience that it propelled him and ultimately my whole family toward this tradition. And it's amazing how sometimes horrible things happen so that we can find that hidden blessing that's been here the whole time. We just didn't see it or were able to recognize it because we need to slow down to really appreciate how fortunate and blessed we are because we have a body, we're alive. You know, we're here, we exist. And the yogis remind us that this existence, the fact that we can see through our eyes, that we can breathe, the fact that we can think, that we can contemplate, that we can move, that we can experience, this, what we have right now, is more precious than all the money that the bankers cling to. All the fame that people strive for, whether it's in the music industry or in the art, whatever, like that outward seeking, we're looking my realization through, through my path, through my practice, has been that I was looking for what I had the whole time. I just didn't know how to look back inside because there was too much pain. I couldn't break through that layer of pain. It was too much for me to handle. But yoga gave me the tools to crack the wall that I'd built up to protect myself, to pierce the armor and to move through that initial firewall so that I could taste that which is in me all the time, that which shines in me as me, shines in us as us, which appears as all things always. Never, ever is it absent. Only the mind thinks it's absent. It's in everything, now, eternally, forever. It is the love that holds us together, that orchestrates the universe. So this was my journey across the gradient from darkness to light, from suffering and pain to feeling like purpose finding my path. How are we doing on time? You're good. So, first I just want to acknowledge you and thank you so much for just letting me um, go on that sort of journey because it's been a long time and I, I haven't, a lot of these stories I never, I never really shared publicly. Um, and I gave a TED talk a while back and I talked a little bit about it, but this is the first time that I, f I feel like I've been really able to kind of open up and sort of remember those, you know, dark periods because for a long time I just wanted to keep it behind me. I wanted to keep moving forward. But I feel like I finally got to a place in my practice where I can turn and look and see and extract the jewels from all those experiences. And now I'm harvesting it so that I could share it. And I'm hoping that in some way, shape or form, it'll benefit anyone out there who's still in that dark place, who's still suffering, who's still struggling, um, you know, whether it's violence or drugs or just feeling lost and confused, like you don't have direction in life. 
you know, this is my testimony. This is what I've witnessed, what I've experienced, is that through yoga and meditation, I found a way to be free, to be happy. And um, thank you so much for taking the time to listen. I really appreciate you guys being here. <laughs>